I'm just on a roll with these more obscure games lately, aren't I? Although these two are perhaps a little more popular than titles like Beyond Good and Evil or Shenmue, today's dual review will be on the first couple of No More Heroes games developed by Grasshopper Manufacture, originally Wii exclusives from 2008 and 2010, then went into spin-off territory with Travis Strikes Again a whole nine years later, which we'll maybe look at another day. And we're finally getting a third main entry sometime next year. No More Heroes is another one of those series of games that not a vast amount of people know of, but those who do are quite fond of them. If you weren't aware of series creator Goichi Suda, or Suda51 as he's nicknamed for the No More Heroes titles, then you may recognize him from his other cult classic Killer7 from 2005. I've honestly never played this one. I first got a GameCube around that time too. I'm not sure why I never did pick it up. I mean, the gameplay just looks alright to me, but I would like to at least give it a go someday. Actually, I didn't even hear about No More Heroes until I saw a video review of the first and second games from YouTubers Some Call Me Johnny. Back in the days before before he started his more popular Johnny vs. series. After watching the videos, I thought, hey, these definitely seem like my kind of games, and I picked up a copy of the first No More Heroes for a couple of bucks at my local game store. I was playing it in the middle of my college years, a British college slightly different to American colleges, but I can't remember the exact year I played and finished it. It's been at least eight years or so now since I last went through it anyway, and in the hopes that Mr. Ortiz stumbles upon this video, many thanks for introducing me to No More Heroes. Who knows when I would have found these gems otherwise. Unfortunately, since I live in the UK and got the European release of No More Heroes, the blood had been completely taken out. So instead, killing enemies simply made them burn away and drop a lot of coins, which is so lame. Luckily, with both games recently getting Switch ports, the blood's been brought back no matter where you are, and they're the versions I'll be looking at in this video. There is also a PS3 and Xbox 360 remaster called No More Heroes Heroes Paradise, containing higher definition graphics and a few added bonuses like more minigames and optional boss fights from the sequel, but apparently the slowdown and screen tearing is awful, and it's expensive to boot. The Switch port is based on the Wii original, only now with cleaner visuals and controller support. The story's pretty easy to follow. You play as Travis Touchdown, a full-on otaku, stuffing his motel room with anything anime and manga related, and lives in Santa Destroy, a fictional town set in the land of... California. Travis manages to win himself a bean katana through an internet auction. As anyone would do. It's pretty much a makeshift lightsaber, but it was actually inspired by the Japanese TV series Space Sheriff Gavin. The only thing I know about this show was that the suit was apparently reused in Power Rangers. So now with barely any money left, Travis gets approached by this lady, Sylvia Crystal, who works for the so-called United Assassins Association, and offers him a job of using his newfound beam katana to kill the 11th ranked assassin, thus taking his place. Not sure if the ranks are within Santa Destroy or the entire world, but anyway, Travis puts his foot in the door by becoming number 11, not realizing that if he stops there, then other assassins will try to steal his title. With basically no way out of this, Travis requires some extra motivation by asking Sylvia that if he keeps going and becomes the number one ranked assassin, he'll get to have his way with her, with Sylvia only providing a vague answer. Don't you just love it when the protagonist's ultimate reward is to have a one-night stand with someone instead of pride or helping those in need? I'm pretty sure Custer's Revenge had a similar goal. Oh hell no, I ain't showing a clip of that game, I wanna stay monetized. However, as Travis builds his way to the top of the list, there seems to be more going on than he's led to believe, and the motives behind Sylvia and the UAA get more and more questionable. But Travis just figures, eh, I've come this far, may as well finish what I started. This is about as perfect of a setup for a video game as you can imagine, and I think it's something you should go in blind. The ranked assassins are all the game's boss battles, and a large part of No More Heroes' enjoyment is looking forward to seeing who you're going to face next, and how much more twisted and sadistic they may be compared to the previous assassin. You have a moment with each one to get an idea of what their personalities are like right before the battle actually starts, and personally, I found these guys to be more interesting than Travis himself. I don't dislike him, but I think it all comes down to the game's script. While it's passable and has an occasional clever line, the cursing can sometimes feel pretty unnecessary, not just with Travis. And half the time the humor is on point, but the other half is mostly innuendos and sexual advances. Not usually my kind of humor unless it's something like South Park or Team America, and even then, those aren't their strongest jokes. But I understand that some people don't mind that so much, and that it's all supposed to be satire for anime culture 
culture. Now the true ending? That was damn funny. I believe the writing is at its best when it comes to the ranked assassins themselves. They're only short scenes, but I instantly want to know more about them than will Travis get to sleep with Sylvia or not? Although there's a surprisingly decent story thread about that near the end. Hands down, my favorite of the ranked assassins is Dr. Peace. All he does is talk about having one last meal with his daughter, but I am hanging on to every goddamn word he says in that cool, suave demeanor of his. A big factor to that is the brilliant performance by Richard McGonagall, also known as Sully from Uncharted. His role may be short-lived, but he is making every second count and having an absolute ball doing it. Don't die on me too quickly. I want to gorge myself on this sense of fulfillment till I vomit. The only problem I have with Dr. Peace is that he's only the second boss in the game. They peaked far too early with this dude, though the other assassins can be very fun to watch too. I especially like Holly Summers, Destroy Man, and Harvey Mazayevich Volodarsky. Apologies if I completely butchered that. There are some very recognizable voices in this game too, bizarrely a lot of them having also done Metal Gear games. It's almost like a Metal Gear get-together of sorts. You've got Travis, who's voiced by Robin Atkin Downs, aka Kazuhira Miller. Holly Summers is voiced by Kim My Guest, who also did Mei Ling, Josh Keaton plays Destroy Man and Young Ocelot from Snake Eater, and Quentin Flynn, aka Raiden, plays Henry, another assassin not affiliated with the UAA, but enjoys impeding Travis's progression. Well, a total of two times, anyway. Again, I know very little about Henry, but I already want to know about his story, and man, I feel so bad for Quentin Flynn. He's a talented voice actor and has landed some good roles. I loved him as Prince Vorkin in The Wonderful 101, but it's so hard not to forget the time he played a whiny little bitch in Sons of Liberty. So yes, I would overall say the portrayal of the villains are a massive success. I enjoy Henry for the brief time he had. Even Sylvia got a few entertaining moments, but I think a little more work could have been done on Travis himself. Just a reminder, I don't think he's a bad character. He has a good line here and there, and also a couple of interesting scenes where he grows as a person, but compared to everyone else, he falters a bit. Still though, I can't really imagine a No More Heroes game without him. You need someone there to be the punching bag that shows how intimidating the other ranked assassins are, and and Travis kind of fits the bill. Let's get to the gameplay anyway. I think I've talked about the story and characters long enough. At its core, No More Heroes is a simple linear hack and slasher, but there's also an overworld to explore when you're not in combat. While using a controller, you can press one of two buttons to swing the bean katana, one for low horizontal attacks and one for high vertical attacks. Travis can also perform punches with two other buttons that, depending on how long you hold it down, could make them dizzy, allowing you to use different wrestling moves on them. I don't tend to use these that much because while yes, it does greatly lower the enemy's health and can be very useful on the bosses. It's often just faster to keep striking them with your bean katana. You can't swing it all the time though, as it does gradually drain its batteries the more hits you land, especially when you use charge attacks by holding down one of the attack buttons. When the battery runs out, the bean katana is completely useless, but you can easily recharge it by pressing the designated button and, well, you fill in the blanks. Put your best comments below. Defending can also drain the batteries a little, though not quite as much as charge attacks. And if you keep keep tapping left or right while blocking enemies, you'll switch to the side and unleash a flurry of attacks, which can be very broken at times. If you have the Switch re-release, but want a more authentic experience of the Wii version, then you might want to consider using the Joy-Cons. There's actually very minimal in the way of motion controls. Swinging the beam katana is all done on one button, and in order to do high and low attacks, you need to tilt the right Joy-Con or the Wiimo up and down. Aside from that and shaking either of the two controllers for... <clears throat> throbbing. The only other instance for motion controls are the finishing moves you need to do after the enemies lose all of their health. You'll get an arrow telling you which way to flick, and then Travis will do one giant attack to bring it on home. And that also applies to the wrestling moves, which need both sticks or controllers. On a regular controller, one arrow was done with the right analog stick. And this last step as a whole could be seen as inessential, but they're so quick and give you a nice juicy pop afterwards that it doesn't really bother me. Once Travis does his finishing move, there's a slot machine at the bottom of the screen that may have a chance of giving you a superpower. Either firing projectiles at enemies, instantly killing enemies by pressing the display button, attacking really, really fast, or hitting a lot harder and doing the finishing move in any direction. These are quite cool when you actually get them, but I swear to God, 9 times out of 10, the superpower only shows up for me when there's only a few enemies left in the room, or in some instances, I've already killed every last one of them. I feel like they could have activated a lot sooner. Yeah, that's 
that's basically it in terms of the combat. Like I said, it's quite simple, but cathartic and unbelievably satisfying when you sweep an entire row of goons with one blow. The sound mixing is pretty off though, the hack and slashing is way louder than everything else in the game, and you're not given a vast amount of audio options to tweak, so you're stuck with it, I'm afraid. Combat's not entirely the whole game anyway. As I mentioned earlier, there's also an open world that you navigate in between ranked battles. This is what you'll be doing for maybe 60% of the game. Driving around in Travis's cartoonishly oversized motorbike, buying new duds if you want to, locating balls scattered around to learn more moves from this drunk guy, purchasing wrestling tapes from Travis's best friend Bishop, inspiring him to try out more wrestling moves. You can also head to the gym to improve your strength, health, and attack combos by doing the easiest of minigames, visit Dr. Naomi's lab to buy more powerful bean katanas with extra parts, and most importantly, partaking in side activities to earn money. Now that sounds like a lot you can do, but it's really not. You'll only find yourself in each building for maybe a few minutes at most, and then you're back out into the overworld doing whatever else you need to do, eventually engaging yourself in the side jobs and assassination missions to acquire money. The main goal in the overworld is to accumulate enough cash to enter the next ranked battle. While you can easily find money by digging certain spots and kicking dumpsters, unless it's the occasional new t-shirt, you sure you want to be wearing that? Side jobs and assassination missions are how you're going to earn the most money. Well, more so the assassination missions. The side jobs are basically chores you gotta do in minigame form for a short time, but they don't net you nearly as much income, and the assassination missions are pretty much how they sound. You drive to the target's location, kill whoever you need to, and earn way more money than you would have done doing the side jobs. The only reason to even do the side jobs is so that they unlock more assassination missions. You do them once, and then never do them again. The side jobs aren't all that fun either. The tasks are incredibly menial, such as continuously mashing the A button to carry coconuts, mowing the lawn, filling cars with gas, picking up trash, or catching scorpions that can poison you and delay your progress. The assassination missions give you all of that enjoyable hack and slashing we talked about earlier, so do those instead. No matter the job you pick though, navigating to them can be more troublesome than they need to be. First off, you have to drive to the agency holding the side jobs or the assassination missions. You pick the job, afterwards you need to make your way to the given location, and then the mission will start. I overall don't have a problem with the idea of an overworld, but it needed to be handled better than this in my opinion. And good lord does the bike control like ass. It's somehow both too stiff and too loose at the same time, never in between. How do you do that? For as long as you spend driving around, however, the stages you go through before fighting the next ranked assassin can be rather short, and they're not all fantastic either. The Holly Summer stage has far too many barricades to clear, and the Let's Shake one is literally a massive hallway with beam katana wielding enemies. No twists and turns, no nothing. It's got its problems, but I'd say No More Heroes has plenty of charm to make up for it, and like I said, the premise alone as well as the excellently portrayed villains are worth the price of admission. The Wii version is dirt cheap these days, but I'd recommend getting the Switch release if you can. You don't get the bonuses that Heroes Paradise contains, but you do get portability and crisper models compared to the Wii original. Not much more to say other than that, so let's quickly move on to No More Heroes 2 Desperate Struggle, where I'll also be talking about the Switch version. I've never actually played this one before, despite heavily enjoying the first game, so I'm looking forward to seeing what we've got here. Back in a 2008 interview with Suda51, he said he'd only do a sequel if the first one had sold well enough. Well, luckily, even though sales in Japan weren't that great, it sold way better in America America and Europe, so the second game was made. And keep in mind that I'm gonna cover some light spoilers, so remain cautious. No More Heroes 2 takes place three years after the original, with Travis fighting the brother of the 11th ranked assassin from the first game, where upon winning, he's approached by Sylvia, telling him that he's now ranked the 51st best assassin. Wait, 51? Why such a big leap? And what was Travis doing in between games? There are people starting from the sequel who don't care about continuity, you know. Besides, it would take forever if I recapped every detail of your fall from greatness. Players would skip it. It's so boring. Oh, all right, I get ya. The writers couldn't be bothered to fill in the gaps. Makes perfect sense. So Travis has to work his way down the list again, with Sylvia once more offering to go to town with him if he makes it to number one. Soon after, though, Travis's best friend Bishop gets ambushed by a local gang and gets brutally murdered, then has his head delivered personally to Travis. Now, instead of fighting for sex, Travis aims to get revenge on Bishop by taking down the new top-ranked assassin, Jasper Bat Jr., the CEO of Pizza Bat. One of the previous game's assassins, Shinobu, eventually comes back to kill two of Travis's targets now that she thinks of him as her master, and he gets to play as her for two levels. 
levels. I'll go over that in a bit. I'm gonna be honest, folks. I don't think the story in this game is nearly as good as the first one. Suda51 wanted to make No More Heroes 2 a bit more serious than its predecessor, but still try to maintain the original's quirkiness, and it doesn't quite reach the mark, if you ask me. Travis is a lot more angry this time, whether it's because his best friend's dead or getting pissed off at the UAA for seeing assassins as their playthings instead of living people. The first game could be serious as well, but not until the last few ranks before reaching the end, and it was usually satirizing itself. The sequel starts off okay with some tongue-in-cheek humor and a few quips here and there, but the laughs and jokes become fewer and fewer the longer the game goes on. With that in mind, the ranked assassins themselves are also a downgrade from the original. The reason being is that Travis, Shinobu, or Henry for the one boss he has hardly get any time to interact with them, minus a few exceptions. You go in, they say a couple of lines, and then it's boss time. No fanfare, no build-up, you don't get anything. The closest you get are these moments with Sylvia explaining their character in some sort of club. This was absolutely not needed. It should have been up for the assassins to express themselves. Also, with 51 ranked assassins, you'd probably be thinking, oh Christ, how are they gonna fit 50 boss fights in one game? Well, the answer's simple. You cop the hell out. The first instance is really early in the game when you meet Charlie McDonald, who's ranked number 25. Where are the other ranked assassins? They're his cheerleaders, of course. How could you not know that? Then around halfway through the story, there's this 12 assassin battle royale happening, with Travis not participating until all but one of the other assassins get killed off screen. And finally, Henry helps Travis out by axing four of the ranked assassins, three of which we don't get to see either. This really begs the question, if No More Heroes 2 completely chickens out on putting in 50 ranked assassins, why even bother making a top 50? There's about 15 bosses total, which is more than the first game anyway, so why not just make it a top 15 list? A top 50 list seems pretty pointless if the game's not gonna fully commit to it, and even then, the only assassins that really stuck out to me were Kimmy Howell and Alice Twilight, and I guess Jasper Bat Jr. himself, but for very different reasons. Kimmy's voiced by Jennifer Hale, by the way, so we can add her to the list of Metal Gear actors too. I wanted to like Margaret Moonlight because her design kicks ass. I'm a sucker for the gothic Lolita style, but it's a shame we barely get to know her before the fight commences, other than she's a skilled sniper. Margaret's like a diet sniper wolf. The gameplay at least somewhat makes up for the weaker story in Assassins, though I have my issues with that as well. But I'll start with the things No More Heroes 2 gets right. Firstly, while it doesn't look like it, combat feels more tight than the previous game. The controls are exactly alike, but things just feel smoother this time around. It's difficult to describe without playing it for yourself, so all I can really say is give it a whirl and you'll see what I mean. The only aspect of it that's changed is melee attacks being another way of lowering health instead of making opponents dizzy. I'm glad to say that the superpowers also appear at more convenient times, and replacing the insta-kill one is Travis turning into a tiger to maul enemies in a single hit. This is a great inclusion, especially against the bigger fellas with crap loads of health. The Lucky 7s one though was what you really want to get, acting as a large nuke, killing everybody in the room. It was in the first game as well, but I unfortunately never got it. The superpowers are all awesome again regardless, and if you want even more destruction, once the tiger on the lower right corner feels revved up, Travis can activate the new ecstasy mode at the push of a button. You're invincible for a brief time, you hit harder, and you move faster. It's essentially the devil trigger from Devil May Cry, but it always feels so damn good using this, and it clears hordes of enemies very swiftly. What's more is that Travis can also swap different beam katanas on the fly with their own attributes. You start with the standard one from the last game to keep things balanced, then you can buy the Camilla Mark III for faster attacks and knocking enemies into the air. There's the Peony you can get for an extremely hefty price, and it's slow as hell but packs a wall up and reaches farther than the other beam katanas. And finally, there's the Rose Nasty you get later in the story with a shorter range and quicker battery consumption, but attacks at an incredibly rapid pace. My top pick is the Rose Nasty, but I sometimes switch to the Peony for heavy blows, and I love using it in ecstasy mode to completely ruin everyone's day. Like with the first No More Heroes, though, when you're not fighting, you're out getting other stuff done in Santa Destroy. But this time, the overworld has been ditched entirely, and you no longer have to pay money to enter the next ranked battle. You just do it whenever you feel like it, which I see as both a good thing and a bad thing. Yes, there wasn't much going on with the first game's overworld, and scraping for cash did get a little tiring and repetitive after a while, but I'd argue the overworld gave you some needed downtime after just beating the ranked assassin, and you had something to look forward to once you finally made enough money to challenge the next one. In the sequel, sure, omitting it makes things much faster, but there's not as much build-up as a result. I don't think the answer was to completely erase the overworld, just keep trying until you get it right. Then again, if I was asked to keep doing these new side jobs, I probably would have gone nuts. 
No More Heroes 2 has turned them into 8-bit style minigames, some of which can be fun for maybe a few minutes, but they go on for way too long if you want the biggest payment from each one. Each minigame contains a few stages to go through, and the more you clear, the more money you earn. But there's still a maximum amount of stages before you're done, and you're gonna want to do as many as you can because your wages will be peanuts otherwise. Hey, just like in real life. As you acquire Moolah, the only things you can spend it on are more clothes for Travis, up to two beam katanas from Naomi's lab, yeah, only two of them, not even with extra parts, and hold on a second, what the hell is going on here? Is she even able to stand? Actually, now that I mention it, most of the women in this game show off some skin here and there. The first one had some partial nudity from the females as well, but not quite to this degree. In the game's defense, though, they made the gym owner's pecs jiggle as well, for whatever reason, so at least they're equal opportunist. Right, right, anyway. The only other thing you can purchase is different training sessions in the new gym. They're split into two categories, stamina training to increase your health, and muscle training to improve your attack power. Like the side jobs, these are simple 8-bit minigames that thankfully only last about 30 seconds each. The stamina one has you run back and forth on a treadmill as it sporadically changes directions, and the muscle training involves Travis punching and kicking barbells at the right time, kind of like a rhythm game. The stamina training is pretty easy once you get the hang of it and keep to the middle, but the muscle one can be very strict on how many barbells you're allowed to miss. You have to be near perfect to get that extra bit of strength, and the more courses you finish, the more expensive they are and the harder they become. Good thing I've been playing a lot of Hatsune Miku Project Eva Megamix lately, and I generally enjoy rhythm games. Once again, the best of the side stuff is when you're actually in combat, in this case, taking down some of the people who killed Bishop. Though there aren't nearly as many of these as the assassination missions in the first game, and once you clear them, you can't do them again. All you get for beating every one of them is having Travis not wear a jacket. Yay? You know, for a game that outright states to be for both newcomers and returning players, they expect you to absorb a lot at the start. And No More Heroes 2 really doesn't do a good job explaining how everything works. There's barely any guidance with any of the side activities, including the gym. Hell, the treadmill game only told me to keep tapping the left and right bumper buttons, but didn't tell me that I'm also supposed to use the left analog stick to change Travis's directions. The one time a game doesn't prompt me to move with the analog stick like I'm a freaking dumbass and it's when I needed it most. Go figure. I haven't even mentioned how you can optionally reduce weight off of Travis's cat, Jean. You would need to spend a long while with her over the course of the game, and all you get for making her thin again is a new move you probably won't even use. Slight nitpick as well, but I miss the announcer saying the name of the ranked assassin you're about to fight, and then a silhouette of them appears to make you wonder what they look like. It provided great suspense and got you pumped for what's ahead. Not that it matters anyway, because most of the ranked assassins barely get any screen time as it is before we start fighting them. And gee, are a lot of them pathetically easy. I wouldn't say I'm an expert on video games, maybe decently skilled, but I managed to get through a number of the bosses with hardly a scratch on me. Some of them can be pretty annoying, like Nathan Copeland, though his room seemed to do more damage to me than anything else. Ryuji hurts a lot, and you have to joust motorcycles with him in the first phase, and I had heard horror stories about Jasper Bat Jr., especially the second phase, but I didn't find him to be as bad as other people made him out to be. He does have an obnoxious teleportation system that allows him to throw punches without you noticing, and by god do not stand next to a window, because he'll punch you straight through it and that's an instant game over. How lovely. Aside from that, however, yeah, Jasper's a little irritating, but it only took me a few tries to beat him. Undoubtedly, the best boss fight in the game for me was with Alice Twilight. She and Travis talk for some time about assassins being seen as nothing but cold-blooded killers when they have their own reasons to fight. She's got an over-the-top arsenal with six beam katanas at once, and the actual battle is fairly challenging. Not too hard, but not too easy. Yes, more of this, please. The levels before the fights can also be pretty inconsistent in terms of design. Sometimes they're too short, other times they're too long, and occasionally there's just a whole lot of nothing, like this motorcycle section. Why did this need to be here? I don't really know how to segue into this, but it's important to mention that Shinobu also becomes a playable character for a couple of ranked missions. She controls similarly to Travis, just with a few cosmetic changes, but her charge attacks unleash projectile beams, and she has a jump button on top of that. Though don't get too excited, she's clearly taken jumping lessons from the Belmonts. Once you jump, you are fully committed to that direction with no way of changing it. I wouldn't say the platforming is terrible, but it's definitely no Super Mario Brothers, I'll tell you that. Shinobu's missions go on for quite a while, too. She's fun to play as, don't get me wrong, but I'm glad she's only got the two levels. Any more than that would have just gotten boring. Henry, however, is on the other end of the spectrum, in that he doesn't have enough levels. Only one, and it's not even accurate to call it a level, just another boss fight. He's enjoyable to play 
play as too. Again, I probably wouldn't spend an entire game with him, but more than one damn boss battle, come on. I do like playing No More Heroes 2 overall, but it certainly has more problems than the first game, and it's lost some of the charm as well. The combat's better, and a few other minor improvements were made, but everything else just doesn't quite meet the same standards. It's still worth playing for sure, but definitely start with the original No More Heroes, despite what Sylvia tells you in the sequel. The game's a few hours shorter than the first one as well, and it does feel like it wants to get itself over and done with as fast as possible. I can only hope that No More Heroes 3 adds everything that worked in both games and we can have something really incredible. Again, I don't know what else I could say about No More Heroes 2, so if you like the look of this and the first game, go play it. No matter which version, just give them a chance and see what you think. I'll consider reviewing Travis Strikes again before No More Heroes 3 comes out, but I'm in no rush right now. We're approaching the end of 2020, all the games are coming out, and I want to do another video before we reach 2021 and start the next marathon. Uh, in case you're wondering if I'm going to be doing Kingdom Hearts Melody of Memory soon, sorry, but not quite yet. I'm waiting for a price drop on that game. And I also haven't gotten myself a PlayStation 5 as of now, so we won't be reviewing Spider-Man Miles Morales shortly either. It's still going to be a pretty busy couple of months for this channel regardless. For instance, I want to quickly go back to the Yakuza series real quick with Zero since it's the holiday season and it once again takes place in Christmas. So I'll try to release the video on time this year too. Uh, so we'll be taking a look at that next and then afterwards we'll be returning to the land of Hyrule with Hyrule Warriors Age of Calamity. Another warrior spinoff. Mm. Alright, thanks everyone for watching, stay safe, stay healthy, and take care of yourselves. No good outtakes in this video, unfortunately, folks, so I will quickly take this time to thank Octary Aditya, I really hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, for doing my new portrait. It looks really, really good. I, I asked her to do it in the style of the Persona 5 confidants, and I think it came out extremely well. I'm very pleased with it. And if you want her to do your own portrait, you can check her out at her sketch mob page and give her a commission. Or if you want to see some of her other work, you can go to the art station page. I've linked both of them in the description below, so please go check it out. Give her the support she needs. Thanks again for watching and you all take care.